Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's webinar. We're back on our labor series this week, and uh, we're joined by Marion, as we were the last day, and we're also joined by Aidan Ahern. So Aidan is farming down between Capaquin and um, Dungarvan, and uh, he was part of some, of some of what you're going to see today will actually be kind of part of what was done at the dairy conference last year in terms of lean management and labor efficiency. But Marion, Abigail, and Padraig O'Connor worked with Aidan about 15 or 18 months ago in order to try and streamline his milking process a little bit. So Marion's just going to go through a presentation first in terms of uh, setting the scene in terms of what they found when they went to Aidan first, what they changed with him and then how he benefited from the changes and Aidan is going to come in and out as we go along maybe uh, and questions at the end for him as well in terms of the process. So thanks Aidan for coming on and thanks Marion and uh, you can share your screen there so Marion to show the slides please. Perfect, thanks Stuart, thanks for having me and again thanks again to Aidan I suppose for um, being part of the whole process and I suppose being you know, as you'll see later on, you know, you're incredibly honest and open um, with the firm and, and gave us free run. So, um, yeah, just to start off, Stuart, I just thought I'd, you know, it's important, I suppose, to give the context of, you know, is it the title of the webinar is working efficiently and, you know, what is achievable out on firm. So this study was done um, in 2015 by um, PhD student Justine Deming at the time. And it just shows here that in terms of the, um, you know, the number of cows on a farm, so less than a hundred farmers with less than 150 cows, 150, 249 cows, and greater than 250 cows. And on the left hand side here, we've got the hours worked per year for everybody on the farm. Um, and we can see here as expected as the herd sizes increase and, you know, the total hours per year increases. Um, and then if we look that on the, you know, on an hours per cow basis so that we can compare across farms, we can see that, you know, it has the opposite trend. So as cow numbers increase, we can see that there's a reduction down in the hours per cow. So that's expected. You know, you know, there's an economies of scale effect here. Um, but I suppose within what it doesn't show there, they're the averages for the year, but within each of those averages, there is extremes and you know it, there is variation between every farmer. Um, and these were selected as was as being efficient farmers starting off with, and even within each of those categories there was huge variation. So the scope to be efficient regardless of herd size. Um, and also, you know, there is still improvement regardless of where you're at as well. Um, and then for the overall year, it was um, on average taking about four and a half thousand hours um, to operate the, the farm um, and about 21, 22 hours per cow per year um, overall. Marion, just to put it into context, then the standard working year, we'll say from an industrial uh, point of view, is two two. I think is it or two three? No, so two two would be what um, most farmers are working around a forty eight hour. You know, assuming a forty eight hour week, and that's what most farmers are generally. You know, the two two is what is what come out from research that farmers are happy to work basically. Okay. In terms of CSO data, in terms of what's an, an, an industrial worker, it's eighteen hundred hours. Yes, okay, All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But look, that, that comes on to the next slide then. So we would have done this study um, with Connor Hogan last year in 2019. So looking at the January to June period. So, you know, in season calf basing system, calf based systems, you know, that's when the peak workload occurs. Um, and what we what Connor found was that regardless of herd size, regardless of whether you're milking 50 cows or 240 cows, Generally, what you found in that period, the hours worked by the farmer was relatively stable. Um, the proportion all right, of what the farmer was contributing to the business was decreasing as the herd size is increasing. And that's because, I suppose, the farmers at, you know, at larger herd sizes were reliant more on contractors and hired staff to, to I suppose, make up that difference between the total hours required and what they were inputting. Um, and equally then, as you said, regardless of you know what the herd size was, very little variation in terms of the hours worked per week by the farmers. So, you know, 57 hours for farmers working with 50 to 90 cows and an average of 73 cows versus 61 hours per week, you know, with someone who was in the 240 cows plus or an average of 304 cows. So that's telling us again that, you know, regardless of farm size, 
farmer hours are tending to stay, con stay consistent and to make up that difference between, you know, what's required to manage the business is being filled by either family labour, family help, um, hired, hired workers or contractors or a mixture of all three. So, so that's what, you know, we found in both studies really was a, it was a similar picture. So then from those studies, um, we, you know, the four key requirements in order to be, you know, work efficiently are, you know, having good facilities and technology. So, you know, example of having good, you know, adequate milking units, um, you know, good work practices, you know, once they feed your calves or, um, you know, I suppose practices that suit, you know, the scale and system that you're at. Good time management, so completing, um, you know, efficient completion of, sorry, of tasks and the use of the contractor. Um, and then good work organization, so good routines. So then from, the, from um, that year long study, if we looked at the tasks as a proportion of the overall farm labor. Um, so we did, there are categories into these, these tasks around here. And what we found, in, found is that milking is by far the most, most time consuming task within the farm year. So it accounts for about a third of the overall working year. So it's, it's a really significant I suppose task and totally un understandable. You know, you're doing it twice a day for, you know, 300 days of the year. Expected that it's, it's pretty much the most time-consuming task. Next one then is, uh, to be you know to be aware of, I suppose, is cow care is at 17 percent, and also I suppose calf care here is coming out at 8 percent as a proportion of the overall year. But in that study that we did last year for that January to June period, it was calf care was coming out at about 14 percent. So. What's that telling us is, you know, it's a small proportion annually, but it's in that, you know, January to June period is when the bulk of all that workload occurs. It kind of makes sense, like, that it dilutes out over the course of the year, so that it's half for the total year versus nearly the 14% is almost double it, like, for the, that June, January, June period, like. Ex exactly. It, it makes complete sense. Um, so I suppose for, for me, like, the, one of the take-home messages is, you know, if, if you're unsure about, you know, you're aware that you know improving workload, or you know you need to improve efficiency, or you, you want to make changes on the farm, but you're not really sure where to start. You know, absolutely milking um, and calf care would be primarily the ones that I would be focusing in on first. Um, and I suppose that's what that's what we did with Eden. So um, as you said, start about this time last year. Actually, we we went out to Eden's farm. Um, you know, who's down in, in Cap and County in County Water, as I said, near Dungarvan, and um, and is in partnership, you know, with his wife Lisa and his father Thomas. Um, and then Aidan, you've got Stephen working on the farm at the moment. Um, and at yeah. that time you had two hundred yeah, two hundred and seven cows on eighty two hectares um, and a sixteen unit herringbone, which which meant that you're doing thirteen rows of cows um, you know, morning and evening. So and you had ACRs and manual drafting. So I think that's that kind of gives a picture, Aidan, of where you were at at the time, is it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. So I suppose you, we kind of reached out to the to the Aidan's discussion group and asked anyone that was involved, you know, interested in coming on board and working with us on, on a mini project, I suppose, to see how lean how lean and how to improve, I suppose, and um, the milking process this would work um, and Aidan got back to us and the one comment that stuck out for me at the time Aidan was you said you know you're doing 13 rows of cows in, in the milking parlour you know it's not sustainable but really before you want to go and either you know go down the expensive route of either extending on units or actually maybe having to change the site of the parlour and building a new parlour you know you want to make sure that you're you're doing everything as efficiently as possible um, and you know I suppose taking out the easy wins first and making sure that you aren't, you know, putting in expensive where where you could make simple gains first. So, and um, that's the background to it, Stuart. And as I said, myself, Abigail Ryan, and Paul Connor went out um, and worked with Aidan and looking at, you know, I suppose we were focusing in on lean, but really anything to do with labour efficiency is almost lean because you're just trying to make things run more efficiently or cut out any waste. So when we went to Aiden, we took a couple of um, measurements um, and we looked at, you know, time the first cluster went on, the last cluster went off, uh, you know, if there was any mastitis cows to be treated, which there wasn't at the time. We looked at the number of, counted the number of times that a, you actually exited the, the parallel pit um, during that milking Aiden and it was 14 times. And then 
overall milking duration was about an hour and a half. Um, average row time, I suppose, at the time reflected, you know, it was coming to the ends of lactation. Um, and it was the overall starting process for the milking and, you know, herding, etc. It was at 20 to 7 and finished at, you know, 20 to 10. So it was a long, you know, total time was taken, you know, between herding, milking, wash up uh, and locking cows out afterwards, you know, it was, it was a full three hours. So it was a fairly, you know, time consuming um, process, I suppose, at the time. Um, and I suppose that based on that, then um, I suppose the first thing to say actually was, you know, Aidan was doing, you were doing an awful lot of things right. As Paul kind of said, when we went in, we were, you know, Paul was like, right, we'd be able to, you know, hopefully make recommendations, you know, in terms of you know, switching your hands when you're milking the plus, you know, milking um, each row. So, you know, lessening the burden, I suppose, on your, on your shoulders and arms. Um, and, you know, talk about, you know, leaving the cows out before the last one was milked, etc. cetera. Um, but you were doing all those things. So you're doing an awful lot of the milking process, I suppose, really well, but I suppose there were still things, little things that we felt that could be improved. So we came up with a number of recommendations. Um, and I suppose then, you know, we went, we went away and left I suppose, and the key thing was, Aidan, you were involved in that process and coming up with the recommendations. Um, yeah. And you were kind of aware, I suppose, of most of those things yourself, subconsciously, I think. It was only then when we said it that you were like, actually, yeah, you know, that that is right. You need to go and adjust, you know. I suppose it gave you the spur on to maybe make yeah. those that you need it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to, I suppose, to, be, to get those things pointed out um, and, and to go and do it. Somebody to say, right, this is to confirm actually you actually need to go and do do these few bits and pieces um to to get things running running a bit smoother yeah so we we left you with the list as, as often it sounds we, we came up with a few recommendations <laughs> you with the list and uh, about two weeks later then we called back um uh, and we did the same we did the same process and the same measurement again to see you know was there an effect of the changes that you implemented um and what we found, you know, I suppose one of the biggest thing was about putting up that piece of stock board there on the on the picture here, um, just to, I suppose, make it easier to for improve the cow flow um, and to try and, I suppose, reduce down the number of times you had to come out of the pitch because that was that was killing time really um, in, in terms of that. And then there was other little things in terms of, you know, the visualization of putting the yellow tape on every fourth cluster to, you know, to keep, cognizant of when to, you know, spray cows and, and do things in batches. And the other one was in terms of 5S, whereas putting in um, just a piece of stock board again, so that you had all your items on the pit, in the pit rather than um, on the, you know, the windows behind you where you had it previously. Um, and again, I'll have a better picture of that later on. So I suppose, Marion, just before you might go back there, just to explain the, the reason for the stock board on the gate, maybe. Yeah, just, just um, clarify for people uh, as to why, because I know the reason, but, and you know the reason. But just in case people aren't clear as to what that did, like, or what was what was the problem there? Like you said, Aidan had to come out of the pit. Why? Why was he having to come out of the pit? Like, yeah. So sorry. Yeah, that, that's it's a good point. So you were coming out of the pit, as I said, fourteen times, um, and the majority of times was literally just to move cows up. That they were all kind of congregating around this area here, um, and and not funneling in into the you know into the into the parlor um, and and part of the reason was because that gate that gate was there and it was open so as soon as cows come out and exit the parlor they're coming down this road here so the first row might go in all right and the second row might go in all right but then anyone anyone rows after that they were seeing these cows that are coming out particularly if they're slow moving coming out and, and not exiting going out you know straight to grass they were tending to con you know, the cows exiting the parlor were tending to congregate inside there. So the ones in the collecting area were tending to hang around here as well and watching those ones and not actually going in. So Aiden was having to come out and be an operator as a as a as a human back engager almost and you know herd them in like. Um, so actually just by simply putting up that bit of stock board there, it just meant that the cows in the collecting yard couldn't see the ones that were exiting out of the pit afterwards. They felt they had to follow them through the parlour to get out, like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and on that, like, I really seen the benefit of that this year. Like, we didn't have a huge amount of time last year because it was the end of October. I've really seen the benefit of that this year. And actually, 
the cows and, and the heifers this year actually go in easier on that side than they do on the left hand side where you you think there's a straight wall going up there that they're easier. So that stock board has such a simple thing has made a huge difference um to 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 the milking process. And on the other point, I like it was one probably one of the biggest things that surprised me was how many times I came out of the pit in that first um, milk. I didn't realize, I think he asked me, I thought it said maybe five or six times at the most, and it was, you know, 14 or 15 times, like, you know, so you, you when you get into doing something by habit, you you actually don't realize how often you, you um, do things that are using up time. And Marion, there's just a question there. Familiarity breeds contempt, as they say. What, what is it, 5S? Will you explain 5S? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that'll, that'll come up. I'll explain that in the, the next few slides there. But um, yeah, it, it's a basically a technique to make sure that everything is a place for everything and everything in its place. But yeah, I'll explain that in about two or three slides time. So don't worry, it's coming up. Okay. <laughs> um, so then the other thing Aidan, that you did um, since last year is actually in terms of the visualization. So this is, I suppose, visualization is all about making sure that things are easy to see if you, and I suppose we're used to it in every day and farmers are used to it every day in terms of you know either using freeze brands tags you know heat detection tail paints um you know you know marking cows for antibiotic milk you know it's used to us we're, we're so used to it on farms as it is and it's lean is all about um you know, I suppose increasing that visualization and increasing those things to make everything easier. So you're taking things out of your head and putting them, you know, down so other people can see them. Um, so when you said that these are your descaling drums and these are the days you use the descaler. Um, and then you just simply, just very simply write it on the barrel. Um, and then you write as well on every time you start a new barrel. So then you know roughly when you need to order the next one. Is that right, Aiden? Yeah, that's a, that's right. You know, it's just simple of simplifying, making it as you said, visual that it's there. It might seem right. There's no need to do it, but it actually makes it so much easier. Especially if you've if you've staff or or people coming in and out, like and and putting the date on the barrel, it just makes it you you're aware then that right we could be coming. You have an idea, say a barrel will last a month, two months, three months. You say right, I better be watching out when when that will be coming. So you're not stuck then. Oh, barrel is after running out you could be waiting two or three days for, for it to be dropped off. So you can have continuation. And there, it's a very simple thing, um, thing to do um, for, for that. And I suppose with the, the use of non-chlorine, uh, maybe our watch system has gotten a little bit more complicated. So that means, you know, we're, we're doing a, a double wash with D-scale. We were in a high limestone area here. So we do a double wash with D-scale. So um, it should... Just because the process has changed a bit, it's easy to put that on on the barrel. Very easy for anybody to see that you yeah, um, you use the T scale on a, on a Saturday and a Wednesday morning. Marion, actually, I've seen it. Um, I can't describe it fully now because I haven't seen it in the flesh, but I've seen a photograph of it where a guy has a piece of styrofoam in the sitting in the barrel with marks on it for when mm. he needs to order and when it's empty, basically as well. So it's it's floating on the. Um, on the solution in the barrel and it's dropping down as the solution drops in the barrel as well. So that's another, I think yeah. that's a very good, that's very, com combining the two is a good thing actually because there's a certain element of, sometimes people can switch a chemical and they might end up going through an awful lot more than they actually anticipate. And if you have the date written on when you did start using it, it could kind of, to, uh, flag something for you that maybe you're overusing something or maybe not using enough maybe in another case like. Yeah. Exactly. It, for for the T tip, it, it works really well, and that that you can you can monitor through every barrel how much you're using, you know. So yeah. it, it works out very easy on on T tip. It's really good on for that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's it's all about those little tips, just basically to make things easier. And there are things that you know might necessarily speed up a job, but it means that it's just it makes things easier for other people coming in or, or for yourself if you're just you know it takes things out of your head and you can concentrate in on, on other jobs such as you know picking up cows at mass sites etc or you know things that are more important I suppose. So I said what is 5S? So 5S is a process for you know organizing cleaning and maintaining a workplace so uh, and it, what it does is it creates a safe standard efficient um, and effective workplace and then the 5S stand for um, these five steps over here. So you, you sort everything out. So basically, we'd say what we did with Aiden was we um, 
um, took out everything from his dairy um, or part of the dairy um, and we took everything out, we cleaned it and um, we put stuff in order. So we put everything that was needed to be put back into the into the dairy, put it back in there um, and, and gave everything a place and we labeled, put labeled things. Shine refers to just basically keeping on top of that um, and making sure that it's always kept clean and kept tidy and kept on top of things. Standardized then refers to making sure that, you know, everybody knows where everything is and where, you know, what the process is if things aren't put back into their place um, or um, how, how to manage the area. And then sustain then is all about, you know, ensuring that this, none of these low, none of these areas fall down and that you don't revert back to type, as you said, Stuart, and just you don't refer back to, um, you know, your old habits of, of, of everything being just thrown in there. So these are just some examples, some of them from the Dairy Bovine farm, some of them from, um, I think, a farm possibly over in New Zealand or, or the UK, um, about the different areas of where this can work. So here you can see, you know, for the, the fence reels and the pigtail posts, they're all in, lined up in an area. So again, very clear to see if the thing's been moved out. This farmer here has just color-coded a lot of the items. So he's color-coded these items. So basically, you know, if, that are, if a red handle thing isn't, is put back somewhere differently, you know, you know where exactly where to put it. Um, again, tidying up your, your the tool shed, um, these two, the right and left are the, the in the calf shed about having all, you know, your taggers, sprays, um, tags, calendars, everything that you need in the calving shed in one place. And then this one is, is, is like the shadow board that Aidan had on in his farm um, of, you know, for the milking parlor, having like, you know, your ointment, your, markers, you know, paint, you know, tail um, marker, and um, scissors, you know, everything that you need, CMT paddle, everything you need is, is located within the parlor pit. So you're not having to go out and go get ointment. You're not having to go back out again and get, you know, tail paints. Everything is there. So you're reducing down the number of steps that you're having to do to get out or reducing the effort um, that you need and the, there. So again, as I said, what we did with Aiden was Aiden you know, you're very honest, you left everything as is for us when we came in. Um, and this was one half of the dairy, um, of the compressor house, sorry. And, you know, as you said, you kept everything in there. There was, you know, a lot of rubbish and stuff like that. So what we did was, what you did was, you know, you took everything um, from this half of the compressor house out um, and you sorted through it and you dumped the rubbish. You dumped, you moved stuff out that wasn't related to the, that wasn't needed in the parlor and moved them elsewhere. And then you tidy things up so that it um, ended up like this. Um, and, you know, you had a shelf up here. And if we look at the shelf in more detail, this is what it looked like. So you had, you know, a store for your tail paint, you know, your sharps, your, your calf bottle and your gloves. And again, it's just simply labeling. So it's very clear then, you know, if you're going low on tail paint because there'll only be one left or if the sharps box, you know, has been moved to somewhere else, it's not there. It's very easy to see and it's easy for someone to put it back. Um, and again, it's just easier for giving instructions if you're going, so imagine, you know, beforehand asking someone to go up and get the tail paints. In this picture, it's, it's a lot harder to find, whereas if you go up and ask them again, you're losing no time, I suppose, finding things. Absolutely, yeah. And, and just the, the labelling is huge. Like, it, 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 it makes it so much easier to find a place for everything and put them back in place, you know, um, and that has led on to, you know, when you see how effective labeling is, you, you, you automatically tend to do it in other areas. Then it follows on. You say, right, that works. Just do it, you know, in, in different cash sheds or, or whatever else, you know. Exactly. Again, it just makes things, it makes things very simple and very clear. And then it means that, you know, you've got a, a dedicated space for everything. So everything fits in well. Um, then, you know, as I said, this was in the dairy, um, and this was again the before picture. So you know, you had your bolt tank, and you had this calf pump which you were holding your, yeah. your apron on. There was a step ladder. You know, there was hoses all the way around, um, and I suppose that was the first thing we, we we noticed when we went in was that you know, and you did it without even realizing. I think you just were so automatic. You just went into the parlor or into the compressor house got your stuff there, came back out and was either going around this or just, you know, avoiding it. It hadn't realized that it was either a trip hazard or, or in the way potentially. So literally, we just literally took it out, you, you removed the step ladder, um, you know, tidied up the hoses and actually with, by cleaning up the compressor house earlier, you actually were able to fit it in. Um, in yeah. 
So, you know, you were able to, it was still located there for when you needed it, but it was just in a tidier place. Um, again, this is the 5S. So again, you before in you, this was this window is at the front of the parlor um, and you had, you know, all your stuff um, up on top of the windowsill, you know, your paints and your, your CMT paddle and stuff like that. Um, and you, you know, you, you were said yourself, you're quite happy with where it was and you actually didn't realize what a difference of even just bringing those small few things down into the parlor. Again, simply just putting up a bit of a stock board, a few, you know, clips just to hold things up so that everything is there in the one place. Um, and again, just reducing down the number of times you have to leave the, the pit. And then the other thing we did was we worked on, you know, developing out a standard operating procedure and just, again, the idea of labeling things and just writing, mark, you know, writing things up what our switches for. Very obvious to you. Um, you know, you're so used to it. It's automatic to you, but I suppose anyone that's, you know, from farm relief or family members who are not as familiar with what switches or what for what, just writing them up on them and on, on above them or makes things so much easier. So that was the standard operating procedure. And, and then you just, again, put it up at the point of use where it is. So again, anyone can come in and just refer back to that really simply. And I think you were saying earlier on as well, you were saying to us that you, you've taken that a step further and you've done up ones for the calf rearing process and that you put it on the WhatsApp group, is it? Yeah, we put, we made up the, the uh, an SOP for the calves, you know, for sick calves. It was something we did within our discussion group as well. And so we put, I put some of the information we had on on the WhatsApp group with the the lads who were working us. And um, yeah, just you know how much milk replacer to feed, what happens if you have a sick calf, you know, when to transition them, you know, the, all the different stuff for every, and it worked really well except for the fact that if you change your phone, you lose all your WhatsApp stuff. So we will put all of that on a whiteboard. I thought it was really good because everybody had it in your hand. But, you know, by going through the process, you learn something, right? Actually, it's, it's better off. We can maintain it. We can keep it for next year if we put it on a board and leave it in, in, the, in the calf house or, or wherever the most suitable place is. Like, you know, so again, we thought we were doing something really well and we, it did and it worked really well. But as you find out, you know, there's, you, there's something that... I suppose makes it messes it messes it up a little bit, so you develop it a little bit further. And I think that's part of the whole process. There's always tweaking to tweaking to it to, you know, to everything you do in it. That, that's that's exactly it. Lean is a continuous process, and labor you know labor efficiency and improving efficiency is a continuous process. You're continually learning, continually modifying, and continually improving. And I suppose I think what you said there is ideal. You know, put it in the cash shed, even just take a picture of it there, and then you can share that picture on WhatsApp. Is, is probably the simple, yeah, simple solution to that. But as you said, look, you're, you're anyone who doesn't learn from the mistakes is just foolish. So you know, everyone makes mistakes, and anyway, it's not a mistake if you learn from it. So I think that's you know that's the key, and that's part of lean. That's part of labor efficiency. It's part of everything. I suppose we do. Yeah, and I think it makes you more buy into it if you can if you learn from uh, something that you've done wrong that you can say all right I can adapt the process to to make it even better and it make, gives you actually more buy into the whole lean and and five S process when you see you do something you think you do it right and then you find oh we can tweak that and make it a bit better it gives you a hell of a lot more buy into it rather than just following a book or following a um, something say like what she had already done for me um, when you do a process yourself and you tweak it there's way more buy in than like that's it that's it exactly as you know you, there's learning from doing it yourself exactly um, so then as they said those were the changes you made so then back on that second day we did the same measurements again and so we found that you know instead of exiting the pit, pit 14 times you just exited six times so we, you know you reduced it significantly um, and then this was overall you know, you're saved 20 minutes in that milking. Um, okay, so that's, you know, 20 minutes per in, within that milking. Whether or not, you know, it'll be 20 minutes every milking is, you know, is, is debatable. But I, for me, it's still the fact that, you know, starting off, you're still operating to an extremely high level um, and you still manage to make a savings of 20 minutes per milk or in that milking is a huge time saver. And even if it was only 10 minutes for every milking for 300, 300 days in the year, it's, it's a really significant amount of time and I think it just shows for me absolutely all those little things make a huge difference um, and I suppose that that is the whole idea of lean and efficiency you know it saves time you're doing efficient practices and um, it, it's 
about improving conditions. So, you know, I mean, that means you're in more, get more job satisfaction. It's more enjoyable um, you improve safety uh, and you're overall, you're going to increase your profitability because there's going to be less waste. So all of those are like, you know, the benefits of lean. And I think this, for me, this example just absolutely highlights all of those things exactly. Um, and without n- incurring massive costs, I think, you know, all those changes that you made were very, um, minimal costs um, but can have huge benefits. So then, as I said, overall, like when we went out there, you know, starting off absolutely an excellent routine, you know, there was already low wastage and you're already producing a really high quality product. Um, and, you know, if you say, if you say 20, 20 minutes per milking, you know, that would be 40 minutes per day. Um, so, so that was absolutely, I suppose, the, you know, the, the learning for me that, you know, even within a high, highly efficient routine that there's still room for improvement. Um, and I suppose Aidan, comments on the right um, on this side were, were more, the bullet points were, I suppose, what you found. So I, I'm going to let you, you know, talk about your experience, about how, how you found it, um, and I suppose what you learned and, and would take on board from it afterwards. Yeah, I suppose if we start to depart perception versus reality, um, yeah, it, by measuring and, and you timed a lot of the, the stuff we were doing, I found that some some things that I was doing, say washing down the the, the whole where the cows walk out and all that, I, I assumed it took me longer than that it actually did take. So it, it actually took some of the, the the chore out of that job and say, right, that's not taking that long, so we'll, 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 I don't mind doing it. Um, and even say then on on the getting in and out of the parlor. Now, now we routine like we watch. We try the, the target is to try and not have to get out of the pit while you're milking, and like that's a target we set all the time. Obviously, it doesn't always work, but that's your your target and your goal is something to measure against and and do it and and keep that get that time down. Um, um, I suppose to yeah the the lean the the fact that. You know, and I said at the at the time, I wouldn't be the most tidiest person in the world. It's not my personality type, but this gives you a structure to to do it and makes it easier for um, me to 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 key to tidy up and keep it clean. And and so I found for my board B inspection this year, it was very easy. You know, right? It, it wasn't as good as it wasn't as tidy at the at the time before the the thing as what the pitch was there. But we brought it back to that very easily. And it's about maintaining it and keeping the structure. If you go back to the lean idea, you should be maintaining that on a, on a say a weekly or a monthly or whatever basis. So it was very easy to bring it to to um, to the level it needed to be for my board B or whatever. So it, it, when you have the labels and you know the process, it makes the job a way shorter time. So maybe a half an hour inside the, the plant room had it sorted rather than a day, say, would have been the previous board B inspection I had. Um, and yeah, the, the walk before you run, you, you start in a small area. And as I was saying earlier, like the things naturally develop. You, you, we developed it on for calves and, and, and for different things. So once you get confidence of, of doing it in one area, you will bring it in. And we've still a lot to do. Like I wouldn't say, I, I probably would have thought at the end of last year, I would have more done this year. But, you know, between everything this year and and that it's something but you're always conscious of it and, and that's what I think that we've probably made small improvements on everything that my, I mightn't have even have known and I think some of the things we did like I had a student for a month um, from Kildalton there in October and just with COVID and stuff but we put in a, a system in the tractor because a couple of people might be going into the tractor where we'd hand sanitizer wipes to wash the steering wheel wash the, 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 the anything that you touch and that, like, that would have been something that we learned from Lean, you know, how uh, that process of making sure that everything was clean and tidy and that, like, you know, and I wouldn't have known how to do that before the Lean process, and it was easy to come up with a, a process then after going through that. Um, and, yeah, the cleaning is, is addictive. It is, it is, you know, it, people who are good at it know it is addictive, and people that are bad at it um, find that um, it's hard to get started, but once you get started, you're 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 going, you know. So um, I think it, it, it there's definitely a lot to, to learn in the process. And as look as as a food product, we have to be wary of of everything we're doing and, and portray a um, a good clean environment, you know, for both as a food product, but also for people coming in and, and working, like making as what we're talking, what you were talking about two weeks ago, making the farm a, um, 
an attractive place for people to work. You know, um, I think that's that's very important. Very good. So, Aidan, just out of interest, um, from your point, your own perspective, then, what did you feel uh, was the big change in terms of the time saving? Because, like, I, in, when I when Marion showed uh, when I saw the slides there the other day, like your raw time is extremely quick as it was, like. So, like, the beat, there wasn't a huge amount coming out of the pit. Obviously, was one of the, um, one of the main things. I think, things, uh, uh, yeah, I think I, there was a, a couple of things. That I think w by marking the every four cluster made um, a big difference in that we 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 routinely then went back and sprayed after the four clusters. So that that speeded up that marking the slow cows had a big drum. And again, we marked a couple of them this year. You have the clusters on them quickly, and like. If you if a slow cow doesn't get caught, you you know you lose you could lose flow very easily with a with a, a not slow cow like, um, getting in and out of the parlor is definitely out of it and having things having to say all the tapes now would if say if we have a mastitis cow, I would it's part of the process that you bring the tube in with you before you start milking so you have it left up and up on the 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 board at the front so that you're not going out of the parlor to go get a, a tube you know, when, when you're getting, or when you're um, tubing or like, you know, and that, so that um, speeds up all those little things, like, you know, um, and like, uh, you know, 40 minutes is, it, it might be huge, but it, it makes a big difference when you're on the length of time it takes to, to milk our cows when you're pushing it out at, at 13, like we milled four, 13 and a half, we milled 216 this year, so we meant a, a bit extra. So when you're pushing it, all of those little bits um, uh, make a difference, like, you know. Um, and it means people don't get fed up with milking, which is important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's just interesting because, like, as Marion said, your, the efficiency of your raw time was very significant there and you still actually were able to save time again then on top of that. Like, so it's, it's just identifying that routine or, or stepping back and looking in at your routine. And as you said, you got the benefit of Marion and, and Abigail and Padraig watching you to do that for yeah. you. But what do you think that everybody should be, or you've, you've developed the skill yourself now that you can kind of take a step back and look at what you're doing uh, to see is there a better way of doing it. And you said earlier as well that like, it's in your head now all the time to try and I suppose, think through what you're doing in a process type way. Like, so a lot of the things you were doing anyway, but it's just actually, thinking thinking about it before you go and doing the job or or chain looking at the job that you're doing and seeing can we can we tweak this somewhere like yeah and it's structuralizing it's structuralizing what you actually automatic think anyway like you know and that makes it a lot easier to pass it on to staff and, and stuff as well and like i think it, we were lucky in some ways too man that Stephen had just started at the time so he was able to break down the, the milking processes very easily whereas i would have probably skipped the pile of them um, where Stephen had just started it, I think two weeks before that. So that was a big help in that we're able to break, break down all the different part of the processes in the in the milking um, and setting up of the parlor and stuff like that. Because it's very easy to skip a process that you automatically think you're you're doing that, you know. Um, so so that helped. And like I suppose reaffirming it again, the student I had in in for the month of October going through the processes and stuff like that, you reaffirm, you re rethink what you're, what you're doing um, and and uh, to explain it. And it's always good to be able to explain a simple thing to, to another person, like, you know, that really gets you to know, do you know your own process? Um, and look, on, like, we don't, we don't do ever, like, we, we don't draw, unless we have a, a metastasis issue, we wouldn't draw the cows and stuff like that, and it does speed up times. Maybe if we were milking at eight rows, we probably, we might, but we don't have somatic cell issues, so it's something I don't need to do. But if we had to do it, that would slow things down um, a lot, a lot further. Like you know, but there's ways and means around. Like, look, they do in, in, in lots of people would maybe draw two quarters uh, each milking, do it back in the morning, front in the evening. That can every process can be speeded up. Like you know, without rushing. You know, I think that's the thing. You speed up without rushing. And without compromising on product quality, as you said, you, yeah. speed, you know, you could absolutely race through cows. Um, but you'll see issues in terms of cell count on TBCs. I think that was, you hit the nail on the head there, Aidan. You know, you're still 
getting through the cows and doing a really good raw time, but your, your, your cell count was, you know, excellent the two days you went down there, you know, solids were very good as well. So you weren't compromising on quality. Um, and, and in terms, I remember going through the, the standard operating, you know, the, the standard operating procedure on the day. And as you said, you know, you go through every step and then you might say, oh, actually, I forgot to do a couple of steps back there, you know, back two or three steps. And I think that was for me, when we even yeah. to write it down, it was the key thing. And I was like, I think it came obvious to you then, like, geez, if I was explaining this to, you know, to Stephen or to whoever was coming in or someone from the farm relief, it's very hard to expect people, for you to explain it in keeping everything in absolute sequence and then for people to remember it in, in absolute sequence as well. Um, and I, I just see one of the comments there, Stuart, coming in is that, you know, about the idea of making YouTube videos or a, a video of the standard operating procedure, which I think, you know, is a brilliant idea. But I think, you know, we have to be aware, and Oli would have said it in the, 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 the webinar two weeks ago about people learn differently and people remember things differently, whether it's visual, audio, um, or, or kind of doing it by hands-on. And um, so absolutely, the more we can tick off those in terms of how we explain things, the more likelihood of people remembering things and implementing them. So um, absolutely, videos are really good, but I think you still can't, I suppose, come, uh, you know, underestimate the, the power of actually having them written down as well. Because I would think if you're in the milking parlor and you've only got a video of the standard operating procedure of milking and you're, you know, you've got gloves on, you're trying to get your phone out, you're trying to then go back to the WhatsApp message where you sent them the video, trying to find the exact piece, you know, of that video where you're trying to find, you know, what to do, it, you know, you're probably not going to do it or it's probably going to be easy to ring up the farmer. Whereas at least if you've, if you've done the video and they've watched it beforehand, they've got an idea, but also then if you have the written ones up in the dairy as you have Aiden, you can just go very quickly up and just check yourself without yeah. having that hassle. So. Yeah, I, I think the, I think the video would work. With, say if you're doing it yourself, do the video, and you can find the steps to write down yourself. I think it might if you were trying to do it yourself, you you'd be able to see each of the, the steps you go through, and also like say if you had somebody in milking and you had to hold uh, a cow for milking, if you have to go through a whole video to try and get to that point. It's, it'll take longer than just looking at the visual thing. That step is actually there. Oh, how do I hold the milk? Put down that switch or pull that lever or whatever. Bang it and you have it straight away. So I, I think it's a combination of both. Um, you, every, every aid can be, can be a help. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Dave, and I was just going to make it there as well about actually if people want to do this process, you you should nearly record yourself doing it or, or at the very minimum, you cannot do this sitting at your kitchen table. You have to be in the in the uh, dairy and in the milking parlor because you'll be going, you'll have to go into the dairy to do something. You have to come out then to flick something else. You might have to go back to the dairy then to get set up. You record that process and there, you won't do this in one sitting either, like in order to develop a standing, standard operating procedure, which sounds technical, but like in reality, it's just how to, a how-to list really, isn't it? Um, to, uh, to do that right, it could take a couple of cracks at it. And I, w I would have seen from one of the, the dairy gold monitor farms that's uh, in, focusing on lean, Sean Moher, like Sean, had originally kind of done out the, the SOP with just verbally, we'll say, so it was written out, but it was all words. And now he's added the visualization. So he has the pictures of the different aspects for, because switch to, the switch to the left, which way are you looking at the switch? Like, so, you know, it has to be this way or it has to be that way. So I think the visualization is something that, uh, I, again, talking to one of the other guys on the Dare Gold program there recently, he said two years ago, he had, um, a, a place for everything and everything in its place, Marion, as we always talk about, but yet stuff seemed to drift from one place to another. So last year he color coded it like you showed in the, um, in the images that you showed there. And he said it really helped. So obviously people were finding that they had the red handled vice grip or the red taped vice grip in their hand. Oh, that's supposed to be below next in the tool shed or it's what that's after coming from the dairy so they were putting it back where they were putting it back or where it should be put back to whereas even though he had the stuff in the places beforehand it wasn't actually returning to where it should be like so um it's that's just that, that's a big thing like that and and like I, I think it's important to to think like like what you said about the visualization we're doing an awful lot of it as dairy farmers already but we just have to think that little bit extra um that we are uh, like we're we're doing a lot of lean things already, but it's just the, the, the little steps that can make a big difference, really. Like, 
Yeah, like absolutely every dairy far every dairy farmer in the country, probably every farmer in the country is usually is using lean without realizing it. And I think that's you know, lean is a term, but it's it's something that we're doing in our everyday life. And I think what you and Aidan kind of mentioned earlier, it's about being conscious of what you're doing. So in, a lot of times because it's routine, we're so used to doing it, we do things unconsciously. Whereas it, you know, this is all about a process about making making that conscious effort to realize what you're doing. Um, and then just two things in, in terms of the standard operating procedures, as you said, Stuart, they're simply just a set of instructions. That's all they are. Um, one of the farmers that I, I was involved in this, one of the other studies that we were doing, he said he developed out um, standard operating procedure um, and he said took the time and actually handed it to his babysitter who knows nothing about farming for, you know, said for the milking process, you know, can you go and follow that and could you start up the milking parlour? So I think that was just a brilliant, you know, he knew then if she could follow that, you know, that set of instructions, anyone could do it. So that was a really, really good test. Okay, it mightn't be, everyone mightn't be able to do that, but it's just, you know, get someone who's not as familiar with the process as you were um, just to test out the, the instructions to make sure everything is logical. Um, and then the second thing is that, you know, Padre Connor and Martina Gormley have done, you know, a huge amount of effort in terms of pulling together um, various number of, of standard operating procedures and they're available on the Chagas website. So if you, I think if you go onto the Chagas website and even just search for um, top 10 dairy SOPs, there's about 10 dairy um, SOPs there that you can download um, and edit. So absolutely, you know, there are starting points. They're not, because every process on every farm will be different, but they will be, a, they're a good guide, I suppose, to get you started on developing your own ones for your farm. They're a good template. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I think you all need to copy what other, if copy examples of what other people are doing, like it saves you a lot. Why invent or reinvent the wheel when it's there already? You know, so yeah, cop, if, as much as possible, copy what, why if somebody else has done it, copy it and, and, and adjust it to your own situation. Yeah, and, and even Marion, I suppose, Francis Quigley did some stuff there when COVID hit as well mm -hmm. about the different makes and machines. So he linked up with uh, all the, the suppliers of milking machines and put the kind of the starting instructions for most of the, the machines that they have. Because obviously, like we would have said with, with um, Nolig two weeks ago as well, like Aiden's machine could be very different to your machine, to my machine. So even though they might be all made by the same company, they, there can be just little things in each of them. So I suppose... Um, I think uh, we'll wrap it up at that. Uh, thanks a million, Aidan. I suppose there's just one question came in there in relation to what, what are sharps. I suppose I presume that you're just using that for needles. Um, yeah, needles, needles, yeah. For, for to satisfy yeah. for board beer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay very good. Um, so just to, I suppose, to bring, highlight a few things that are coming up. So next week, our dairy conference is on. Again, it's on Zoom. Um, so we have three days on Zoom for you next week at 10 o'clock if you want, if you can uh, afford the time. Uh, hopefully, if you've your SOPs and stuff done between here and then, you'll be able to afford the time. So next week, um, Tuesday is the start of the dairy conference. And the first session is about making better use of fertilizer nitrogen. So that's going to be on from uh, 10 o'clock to about 11. And we're going to be joined by Stan Lawler, who's uh, taken up a role within Chagas on next Monday. He's going to be chairing the session. And Lauren Chalou, Elodie Royal, and... Um, Owen Fenton from Johnstown Castle are going to be talking about how we can look or looking at the research. Can we actually make better use of fertilizer nitrogen into the future? So we're going to be challenged to do that as part of uh, renewing a derogation for 2022. So um, the lads are going to talk about the, the scope for us to actually do that. Um, and then that evening, I suppose, so the, from 10 to 11 uh, is, the, is the, the webinar as such. And then from, 10, uh, from 7 p.m. to about half seven, there's a Dairy Age podcast live with Emma Louise. Uh, she's going to be talking to Mike Egan in relation to Clover, and she's also going to be joined by John McNamara. So John was Grassland Farmer of the Year two years ago, uh, and John has incorporated a lot of Clover onto his farm in the last couple of years now. Uh, so just to highlight how he's finding that and how he's he's doing it. Then on Wednesday, we're going to be talking about improving sustainability, which is obviously everywhere at the moment and will be for t t time to come, obviously, as well. So through improving farm efficiencies, so thankfully, we've been very fortunate that a lot of the things that we've been pushing with you down through the years are actually positive in terms of sustainability. But we're going to talk to John Roach from uh, New Zealand, um, Brendan Horn and Brian Rush from the IFA, is, and also a dairy farmer himself, uh, are going to be talking to Karina Pierce on Wednesday from 10 till 11. And again, then in the evening, 
uh, Patrick Going and uh, Derek Killeen from uh, just outside of uh, Air Court in County Galway. We'll be talking to him and Louise for a half an hour from 7 p.m. to half seven. So we hope that you can join us for that. And then again, we'll be back next week. Next week, I'm going to be joined by John Paul Murphy, the farm manager in Moore Park, who's going to be talking about body condition score. And Joe is going to, Joe Patton is going to join me again to talk to us in relation to maybe what we can do with those cows that may be a little bit lacking in condition at this stage. It's getting a bit late, so there might be some strategies need to be employed. So we look forward to talking to you next week. Um, you have to register for the Dairy Conference, obviously. So just uh, Google Chagas Dairy Conference if you haven't gotten some notification already through text messages or whatever or on um, Twitter and uh, register for that. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Marion. And thanks very much, Aidan, for joining us. And then we'll have Nullig and Marion back again in two weeks' time to talk about uh, making better use of your time and people that may be working for you their time as well. So thanks very much, everyone. Take care and stay safe.